Hello, my name is Chris Nicholson and I'm one of the pastors here at City Hope and welcome to City Hope Catch Up. We're going to be putting out one of these videos every week. It's an opportunity for you to catch up on the latest sermon and often we'll also be putting testimonies up here or bits of information, a bit, bits of family news that we think would be relevant and you might want to find out about. So perhaps you've been on kids work this week or you've been away, or maybe you're not a part of City Hope but you want to keep tabs on what's going on, here's the place that you can do that. I hope you have a great time today. Paul Brown is going to be speaking from the book of Acts. He's going to be uh, giving us a bit of an overview of the first section of Acts. Uh, and then next week, we're going to be carrying on our series uh, looking at the life of the early church. So hope you have a great time and over to Paul. We could get used to this on a Sunday evening, couldn't we? Did you ever lay in this morning? No, of course you never. You was up at five praying, weren't you? Thanks, Chris. <laughs> oh, was you watching the marathon? Yes, that was good fun as well, weren't it? Um, Saturday I went to an old lady's uh, birthday party. Um, yeah, a couple of years ago it would have been a pensioner's party, but they changed the pension age, didn't they? So... Knees up, Mother Brown, that's correct. But, to <laughs> uh, but today, we are going to recap the last... Uh, quite a while ago, we, we started a series in the book of Acts, and we got to chapter 8. So we're actually going to recap 8 chapters. In fact, we're going to recap 9 chapters of the book of Acts, which means we're not going to go into in-depth exposition right? Well, I know, sorry, but we'll be here all night, and I've got a lot to say as it is. But, uh, but I want you to sort of just get the flavour and the gist of it. Kids, if you're listening, don't switch off, because your parents will be asking you questions about what I say, and if you answer them well, they will have some really good prizes for you. What we did, did we talk about this? I can't remember. Yeah, well, I'm sure you'll get some good prizes for your... So, uh, PlayStations may be mentioned, or... No? No? Xbox. Bis uh, so somebody said an Xbox, and, and I think Food Bank were given loads of them, so you could use those egg boxes as well, couldn't you? Um, so let's, let's be, without further ado, because I really haven't got loads of time, let's get to the book of Acts. Um, because it was a long while. I can't remember how long ago it was. I tried to look through my diary and I couldn't find it. It was a long while ago we started this, but we're going to recap, like I said, the first nine chapters. But first I thought it would be helpful to see the important place the book of Acts occupies in the New Testament. Because some of you know, but some of you may not know, the first part of the New Testament consists of four biographies of Jesus. Those biographies are named after the authors. Who are they? Matthew, Mark. Luke and Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Not many of you knew that, or you couldn't be bothered to answer. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the four Gospels. The second section of the New Testament is almost all letters written to, written to churches or written to individuals, uh, beginning with the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Rome, called Romans, helpfully. So, but in between the four Gospels and the, those letters stands the book of Acts. And one way to appreciate the book of Acts, apart from its fast-moving and exciting narrative, is to imagine the Bible without it. Right? So I want you to imagine, you've just read those four accounts of the life of Jesus, and then you turn to Romans, and it starts... Paul, from, the author has introduced himself, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. And you think, hold on, Rome? How did the story get there from Jerusalem? And then the next two books, which are written to the church at Corinth, are also written by Paul. And you think, Paul? Who's Paul? You know, so without the book of Acts... The New Testament leaps from those comprehensive biographies of Jesus, which are, you know, really in-depth and exciting, to a collection of unexplained letters to, like I said, to individuals or churches. But with the book of Acts, everything fits into place. Acts gives a clear transition from the life of Jesus to that new and growing church of Jesus' followers. 
Acts introduces us to Paul, the Apostle Paul, and explains how that, well, that initially small, that embryonic religion gets, crosses the sea to Rome and, and, and spreads across the known world. Very exciting. So the book of Acts opens where, particularly where the Gospel of Luke left off. It's like a sequel to Luke, really, because it's the same author whose name is Luke. You're still paying attention. Well done. Um, so so let's, let's start in chapter 1 of the book of Acts. And in, in chapter 1, we read that you know, since the resurrection, since Jesus came back from the dead after his crucifixion, he'd appeared to the apostles and he'd proved to them in lots of ways that he was alive. He ate with them and he spoke with them primarily. <clears throat> and he talked to them in those 40 days after the resurrection. He talked to them about the kingdom and he told them, very importantly, to wait. Wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit. He said, don't leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then soon after that, we read um, in chapter 1, verses 9 and 11, it says, he was taken up into a cloud. While they were watching, so they just watched him go, and they were just looking up. And suddenly, two angels are there, and, and they said, what are you standing here staring into heaven for? Jesus has been taken into heaven, but he will come back in the same way you saw him go. And then those apostles went back to Jerusalem to wait for the promise. Remembering what Jesus had said to them, to wait for the Holy Spirit, and that they would be witnesses for him right to the end of the earth. There's, there must have been something scary and a bit daunting about that, but exciting. The, what, the Holy Spirit. Maybe they'd read what the Holy Spirit has done in, from the Old Testament when at certain times for certain tasks, the Holy Spirit anointed certain people. People like Samson, who'd done great exploits for God when the Holy Spirit come on. But they're waiting and they're praying and they're waiting and they're praying. And then in chapter 2, suddenly it happened. All the believers were together, we read, and suddenly there was a sound that came from heaven. It was like a great windstorm. And then, so there's like a hurricane blowing indoors, which is a bit disconcerting if you think about it. And there's hurricanes blowing indoors. And then they saw something which must have blown their mind and must have been really scary because they saw what looked like tongues of fire. And the fire separated, and each one of them was anointed by that same fire, right? Which was them being filled with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, you're still with me. So they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Jews from all over the world would have had gathered in Jerusalem at that time for the Feast of Pentecost. There, there was a party atmosphere in the city, and then this supernatural event had happened, and you can't describe it any other way. The Holy Spirit had come and filled this group of people. Things had changed for that little embryonic church. This was what the prophet Joel had talked about when he said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. It used to be for certain people, at certain times, for certain tasks. And now he says, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all people. doesn't matter whether you're male or female, older, young, rich or poor. The Holy Spirit is for you. right? And there's a reason for that. And we're going to look at that in just a moment. And, and, and that, that group of 120 or so people who had gathered in that room, who had, been, had that encounter with the Holy Spirit, were heard speaking in languages they hadn't learned. Languages that people from around the world understood. How come they're speaking in our language? This message of good news, this message of Christ's forgiveness was for all nations. Not just for the Jews in Jerusalem. This was going to go across the world. They didn't know that then, but we know the end of the story. Or we are part of that end of the story, I guess. So they received power. Power for healing the sick. 
power for signs and wonders and miracles. Power to speak up for Jesus with a fresh anointing from him. They, they had power for a new authority and a new boldness. Do you know what? We can lay hold of this same power. We can lay hold of that same boldness. I hope as we run through these chapters, you're inspired to think that's not just for them, that's for me because we're the body of Christ today. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Don't discount yourself. Don't think I'm too young. Don't think I ain't been a Christian for long enough. Don't think I don't know enough about him. The Holy Spirit is for you. And he, he wants to anoint you for purpose. Not just for a nice fuzzy feeling. Not to say, oh, my hands feel warm. Right? Right? There's a purpose for this. There's, a, there's, there's an anointing for the gospel to go forth, for the sick to be healed, for, the go- for, for, for lives to be transformed. Right? So this was the beginning of something fresh, of what ultimately will become a new global community. And then in chapter 3, can you see how I'm racing through this? In chapter 3, they began to put all this newfound power and anointing into practice. You know the story? Do you remember the story of Peter and John when they went down to the temple? Because they were gathering at the temple regularly, daily. And, And there was a fellow there who'd been disabled from birth. In fact, he was carried to the gate called Beautiful every day. And he was put by that gate simply to beg, to ask people for money. He couldn't go to work. He was begging for people as they went in and out of the temple. And he saw Peter and John walking along the road and he said to them, you got any money, boys? Spare a bit of change. And Peter looked at him and he said, I ain't got any money for you, but I'll give you what I have got. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And the account tells us the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed. And he jumped up and he began to walk. And then walking and leaping and praising God, he went into the temple with him. The guy had never walked in his life. Can you imagine this? You imagine this down the blue or at Tesco's, right? Seriously, that's what we're talking about. These, and we want these things to happen, don't we, in our life and our experience? Amen. Everybody saw him walking, and they heard him praising God. And when they realized who it was, it was like, it's him, he's always here. I've never seen him walk in his life. Somebody else would have gone, I know, I know, his mum, he's never walked, he was born that way, it's really sad, he's had to be a beggar. They were astounded by what they saw. Peter and John had stepped out into that promised power and authority. Jesus had said, wait. The Holy Spirit came as promised. They knew the power, but then they stepped out. They didn't keep it to their meetings. They didn't keep it so they could pray for one another and prophesy to one another and lay hands on one another. Good as that is, they took this anointing. They took this power and authority and they went. And we know, like we said, that goes beyond the walls of Jerusalem. But I don't want to rush ahead of myself. So that demonstration of power and authority didn't stop with the healing of that man. Peter then took the opportunity to preach to the crowd. Because the crowds gathered. They're all going, wow, look what's gone on over there. The, you know, that, that man who's paralyzed, he's walking and jumping. So Peter's gone, here we go. I've got, I've got my own little congregation here. And he, gets, and he starts to preach. And he doesn't hold back, let me tell you, because he said to them at one point, he said, talking about Jesus, you lot rejected the holy righteous one. You killed the author of life. Think, blow me. He's talking to us. I didn't nail him to the cross. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. Right? So he's, he's not held back and he's preached and he's carried on to the crowd. He's took that opportunity think, wow. However, there are often consequences of our words. And yeah, and in chapter four, we read, I told you this is going to be quick through the chapters, didn't I? In chapter four, we read what happened to Peter and John. You know what happened? They got nicked. (laughs) They were arrested. They were arrested and put in jail. But listen, I mean, we're we're laughing about this thing. Who who wants to get arrested and put in jail? Don't think 
becoming a Christian means a trouble-free life of peace and prosperity, right? Some people make that mistake, think, oh, I'm a Christian now, everything's going to be lovely and easy and smooth and I'll, I'll always get the promotion I want and I'm going to live in a bigger house with rambling roses and the sun will always shine, right? Some people think like that, right? One day, that's, that's the life, we're, um, we're all aspiring to that and you must be too because, but that perfection comes when we get to heaven, right? Not not now. And for Peter and John, it was far from that because they've been, like I said, they've been arrested and they're in jail. But we do read, as a consequence of their actions, it says, many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of men who believed now totaled about 5,000. And it doesn't say how many women or children had responded. The number of the church is growing. It's growing. It's growing. On Pentecost, 3,000 made a response. Now we see another number, 2,000 more. Anyway, the next day, they were brought before the authorities who demanded to know, on whose authority are you acting? And chapter 4, verse 8, it says, talking about Peter. It says, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. There's a theme running through this, isn't there? Let's not neglect the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people. That's quite respectful. Are we being questioned today because you've done a good deed, because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you, He's, I mean, he's speaking to, to, to the law, he's speaking to the government, he's speaking to the people, people of power here. He said, let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. The man you crucified, he's done it again, but whom God raised from the dead. Right? Wow, that's boldness, isn't it? To speak to people in power like that. Now, they, those authorities have got a problem now, haven't they? They've thousands of people turn into this new way, right? But they said they had a little meeting and they discussed it. They said, well, we, we can't deny that they've performed a miraculous sign and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. So they called the apostles back in. They've gone out and basically make it going to pass sentence, haven't they? They've called them back in and commanded them to never speak or teach in the name of Jesus again. And Peter and John said, okay, fair enough. You're the authority around here, so we won't do it again. <laughs> oh, no, they didn't. <laughs> of course they didn't say that. This is what they said. Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? <laughs> That's what they said. We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. They still, they, he said, they, they still freed them. They were freed reluctantly, but they let them go. And what did Peter and John do in response to that opposition from the authorities? They went to a prayer meeting. They prayed. And, and, and do you know what they prayed at that prayer meeting? They prayed for boldness. As if they hadn't been bold already. It's a constant theme. Let's pray for boldness. Lord, enable your servants to preach your word with great boldness, they prayed. And, and they'd already been doing that. So they prayed, Lord, hear their threats and give us that great boldness. And then they prayed some more. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And how did God respond? Well, we only have to read on a couple more verses. After this prayer... The meeting place shook. I've never been in a meeting where the building has shook. And it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. There's a theme, like I said, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with great boldness. Wow. It, this is going great, isn't it? You know, after four chapters of the book of Acts, we've seen those early believers filled with the power of the Spirit. They've demonstrated boldness on a regular basis. They're speaking in languages they haven't learned. There's been tongues of fire. There's been shaking buildings. There's been supernatural power right across the place. Thousands coming to Christ. Thousands. Bless you too. 
Amen. So they've shown they've great boldness and they've prayed for more boldness. Everything in Jerusalem is glory. Hallelujah. Right? And then we get to chapter 5. Ah. Chapter 5. There's a couple, married couple, by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. Now, the account tells us they sold some property. Now, now the context was people, people were bringing money to land it at the apostles' feet, and they were sharing out proper money, and so no one was going without. Everyone, everyone had their needs met. So this was a bit of practice, and they, they, they sold some property. And Ananias brought part of the money to the apostles. He put some of the money, so he sold his own property, and he's got a money for it, so it's his money. And he's bought some of that money to the apostles. But he claimed it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, she was in on this as well. And he kept the rest. Now look what happens next. Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit. And you kept some of the money yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell, right? As you wished, you, he said, and after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but you were lying to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who... This is a sad thing that's happened, right? It's a sobering thing that's happened, right? So we've had the glory, hallelujah, of one, chapters 1 to 4, and then God has moved in judgment on somebody who's lied to him. Everyone who heard about it was terrified, and rightly so. And if you read on in the account, his wife, does, who's in on the deceit, does the same thing, and she also gets killed. So after all that excitement, stuff has got serious. Could this even stop the advance of the gospel? What has happened now? You know, for us, most of us have a pretty good grasp of the grace of God, don't we? We do say it wrong. God forgives us. Wonderful. I love that. I mean, this is an amazing thing. Don't, I'm not belittling this at all. Grace is a wonderful thing. The undeserved favor of God washing over us time and time and time again. But let us also grapple to hold to the holiness of God too. Be holy because I am holy. Ananias and Sapphira is there as a, a, a shouting at us to not trifle with God, isn't it? And we have a tr the tradition in the West, particularly, or certainly in, in, in our flavour of churches, it's always the emphasis is on grace. And I don't want to take that emphasis away, but I just want to put another emphasis in there of holiness. It's a tough one, isn't it? But even when this sobering incident happens, there were still more miraculous signs and wonders by the apostles. The believers were meeting regularly. It's all carrying on. Listen, we, just on that, we're meeting regularly. Let's encourage one another to meet regularly. Yeah. Don't you love it when this place is packed and we're all here together in anticipation of what God's going to say and do? Right? Don't, let, let's challenge and encourage our friends who say, oh, I couldn't be bothered this morning. No, I've had a, I had a late night. I was up all night. A party with my wife. But, <laughs> let's, but seriously, let's encourage one another to get together, to meet regularly. And it says still more people were added to their number every day. And sick people were brought onto the streets on beds and mats so that Peter's shadow, his, just his shadow might fall across some of them as he went by and they would be healed. People brought their sick and those possessed by evil spirits, and they were all healed. There's power there. There's power for healing. The Holy Spirit is still working. The thing was, this resulted in them getting nicked again. They were arrested again. This time, though, it got even better, right? So they're banged up in prison, and then an angel came at night and opened the gate and let them out. <laughs> 
You can read all this. I know, it's amazing. Read it. Or get your mum to read it to you, right? So an angel let them out of prison and told them, go to the temple and give the people this message of life, right? So he's in, they've been encouraged to keep preaching, so even though they're getting arrested, to keep preaching. So surprise, surprise, instead of hiding low, they were immediately back preaching again in the morning, right? And the authorities didn't like it. They brought the apostles before the high council, the Bible says, where the high priest confronted them. We gave you strict orders. Never again to teach in this man's name. Peter responded, we must obey God rather than any human authority. Mate, <laughs> there's the boldness that they prayed for. You've got to understand, these are people who wield power, Right? So, and what they did, they, they, the Bible just says, oh, they just had them flogged and let them go. You think, hold on, had them flogged? Yeah, they had them flogged for their boldness. It's another example that this Christian life can be really tough and it can be painful. And it may even seem like it's going wrong. I didn't sign up to be flogged and put in prison. Well, actually, you probably did, but you didn't know it at the time. Right? So chapter five, we're up. what's the time? I, don't even, I can't even see the clock. I'm, I've, got age, I've, I've got ages to go and not a lot of time to fill it in. Chapter five finishes with the apostles continuing to preach throughout the city. Every day in the temple and from house to house, they continued to teach and pre preach this message. We read, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the anointed one. Chapter six. Hurry up, Paul, begins with more discord in the church. We've had the Ananias and Sapphira thing. That's not very nice. Now, well, there's stuff going on. The Greek speakers in the church complained about the Hebrew speakers in the church saying, well, their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the apostles, in their wisdom, called a meeting of all the believers, and the people decided on seven well-respected men, full of the spirit and wisdom to manage the situation. Wise move, because God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, we read, and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. It's changing those in authority as well. And then Stephen, one of those respected leaders chosen by the people, is arrested. Oh no, it's gone wrong again. It's up and down, isn't it? Up and down. He's a man full of God's grace and power, we read, who performed amazing miracles and signs among the people, and they've arrested him too. And they accused him of blasphemy. That is serious. And not only did they accuse him of blasphemy, they got witnesses to lie about, against him in court. Now he's facing the death penalty. We get to Acts chapter 7. Stephen spoke to the court. And ended by accusing them of deliberately disobeying God's law. You wouldn't think you'd do that if you were facing the death penalty, would you? You'd say the right things to get off. But there's that God-given boldness again. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation and they raged against him. You can read this in Acts chapter 7. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing in the place of honour at God's right hand. And then they did execute him. And they killed him in a very barbaric way. By crowds of people would have hurled large rocks at him to take him down and kill him. And even as they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my Spirit, And he fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. It was like, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. He's emulating Christ. And then he died. And after the excitement and growth and power and healings in the Jerusalem church, things changed after Stephen's death. We're getting to chapter 8. I'm getting close to the end, right? Chapter 8 opens with these words. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. 
I mean, it was been great up to chapter four, hadn't it? Oh, it was wonderful. It was sweetness and light and hallelujah glory all the way. And now persecution has broken out. Are you coming? What you got for me? Candles? Candles. Uh, oh. Who's this for? Is this for me? Bless you, darling. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ah, oh, you're really kind. Thank you. Ah, oh, you can, people feel free to emulate this. And if you haven't got gifts, it's okay. Um, I'll give you my bank account details. Right, where was I? A great wave of persecution began that day, and it swept through the church, and it resulted in the believers. It, all the believers except the apostles who remained in Jerusalem being scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. If you remember back to chapter 1, and we ain't got time to go into this, th- that was prophesied about the church. They didn't think it was going to happen this way, but the church is spreading out from Jerusalem. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. There's that boldness again. There's that Holy Spirit anointing again. Because you imagine if you was a refugee on the move, you've been scattered. Suddenly the church you loved, which was going great guns, has been broken up. You have gone. Your kids have come out of school. You've lost your job. You've lost your home. You've got your possessions on your back and you're trudging the streets to another town and even another nation. Your church leaders have been left behind. You're on your own. And what do they do? They preach the gospel. That's always challenged me, that passage. Whatever the situation you're in, whatever you're feeling, we preach the gospel. In spite of the hardship, in spite of having to escape persecution, they're refugees, as we understand it, but they told people about Jesus wherever they went. Philip went to a city in Samaria, and it says, crowds listened intently to Philip. Well done for listening intently today. Because, but Philip, it says, they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs he did. Many evil spirits were cast out, screaming as they left the victims. That can also be a bit disconcerting as well, can't it? Right? When you see demons go, it, it gets a bit messy, Right? And many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed. There's that theme again, the sick are being healed. Those healings are signposts pointing pointing to a powerful Jesus who has authority over sickness. And it says, and this is a good response to demons going and sickness going, there was great joy in that city. I want to see more of that down the blue, do you? Where you work, around Tesco's or even, even Lidl, right? Uh, Audis too, mate. Philip continued to preach and he explained the gospel from the scriptures to an Ethiopian fellow who God took him to. Him. And, and after preaching to him and explaining the scriptures to him, this, and this is also interesting, the, the guy's reading the Old Testament and he said to him, do you understand what you're reading? The guy goes, I don't know what this is all about. He said, listen, let me explain it to you. He explains it to him. He goes, oh, it's about Jesus. I want, to, I want to be a follower of Jesus. And, and as, he, as he's explained it to him, he's given his life to Jesus. And he says, well, uh, can I be baptized too? And he baptizes him as well. It's all going great again, even in the face of difficulty. Because there's power in the Holy Spirit. And there's boldness to preach and step out. Then we get to chapter 9. And I really am finishing, Chris. Right, I've only got another page of notes, right? That could go, that could go on quite a way. We get to chapter 9 and, and we meet... Saul, or a guy who, who's called Saul, but he changes his name to Paul. He, and I really will rush through this, but he's referred to in the previous chapter at, at Stephen's um, execution when he was stoned to death. He was looking on and he was agreeing with it. But here we're told of his dramatic conversion when Jesus, the, the, the exalted, risen Lord Jesus, because you remember he's already gone back to, back to the Father's right hand. Paul encounters him on the road to Damascus. Paul was going to Damascus to arrest the Christians. Saul was uttering threats. We call it Saul, he was called then. Saul was uttering threats, we read in chapter 9, with every breath. Every, it's like everything about him was against the Christians. And he was eager to kill the Lord's followers. He's not the best candidate to be um, one of the major authors and proponents of the Christian faith, is he? Right? He didn't like the Christians. He hated them. He wanted them dead. And then we read in chapter 9, as he was approaching Damascus on this mission, 
a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? This hater of the Christians was picked out by Jesus to take the gospel to the people. Some of the people don't like it, but Paul, but Paul took that role and he proclaimed the gospel to the people. And thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people around the world, down through the, down through the millennia, have responded to that message. Did he break into your life as well? Listen, he lo- now this is very important. He loves you. And he wants the very best for you. And he wants you to know his forgiveness and his unconditional love. And he will protect you and watch over you. And he wants to fill you with his Holy Spirit. Surrender to Jesus. That's what he says. That's the message Paul preached and many others as a result. And he preached about Jesus in the synagogues. And it says, all who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the same man who caused such devastation among Jesus' followers in Jerusalem, they asked? And didn't he come here to arrest them and take them in chains to the priests? God will use whoever he wants to proclaim the gospel, and that includes you. That includes you. Don't think, oh, I couldn't do that. I'm disqualified from that. No, you are qualified. If you have been chosen by Christ, if you are a believer today, you, have, you are qualified to proclaim the gospel. Maybe it's to your neighbor. Maybe it's to a family member. Maybe you'll never stand on a platform. You'll never stand and preach to large crowds, but God has anointed you to preach the gospel. He offers his Holy Spirit to you, and his, he says there's boldness for you. There's boldness for you. God will use who he wants to proclaim the gospel. In the coming weeks... We'll hear more about Saul, who became Paul. In fact, but next week, I think we're going to go back to look at Peter, one of those early apostles, and see what he got up to. (sighs) Amen. Well, I hope uh, what Paul brought to us today was a challenge to you, that we've been filled with the Spirit of God, uh, the power of God, Uh, to proclaim the good news of Jesus and there'll be highs and lows along the journey but we want to do it because we uh, we want to be faithful to Jesus and uh, and and take his word to anyone who's going to hear it so there's a big challenge maybe this week you can you can go out there and put some of what Paul said into practice and let us know how you get on but for now have a wonderful week and we'll see you soon